Since I've honed a niche for reviewing steam locomotives, the question has inevitably come up over whether or not I would review other stuff. Normally the answer is one of the following. It's not my best interest, it's taking the mickey somewhat, or there's enough people already talking about it, getting pissed off about it, and getting each other pissed off about it. But my decision not to review Heritage Railways? That's always been a really difficult one for me to explain. It's easy to assume that reviewing a Heritage line, talking about its full history and taking viewers for a journey along the line, is the easiest thing that anyone can do. And when you look at the skeletal version of that concept, you'd be absolutely right. But that's also one of the most tried and tested ways of doing it. There have been tons of railway reviews produced for the VHS and DVD market down the years, which vary in length from a few minutes to about an hour, produced by firms like Transport Video Publishing, Stylus Video, Tallyrail, Online Video, Ian Allen, and so on. Most of these fulfilled a very basic specification for the time when it made sense to produce them for the specialist video market, seeing as there was no such thing as YouTube when the Dead Sea called in sick. But looking back at these programs now, they all seem pretty dated. It's nice to see some of the shots of locomotives which were operational then and are not operational now, and how railways have changed and developed between then and now. But that's not what the programs were initially set out to do. If they weren't principally designed to be a visual guide to new or recurring visitors, or to be a fly on the wall showing the railway's activities over the course of a year, or even several years, they were just generic montages made up of trains passing the camera. Now that sort of action is very nice if you're just seeking those two shots of the USA tank in operation on the Bluebell during online videos Bluebell on Parade VHS, but a montage is not the same as a review. The segment on the Festiniog Railway from the Ian Allen Railways Restored VHS from the early 1990s is nowhere near the same quality and detail as the two and a bit part Festiniog story produced by Rail Films in 2002. On the subject of the latter, you then may think, well, why not produce all railway reviews like the Festiniog story, with two hours of archive clips and interviews telling the story in terrific detail? The thing is, not every heritage railway has a story like that to tell, and even if they did, it would need dramatising somewhat to make it more appealing to general audiences. The Avon Valley story was worth telling in the Total Content Digital series of documentaries from around 2010, as it's littered with political barriers preventing the railway from developing at the pace it wanted, but others, like the Snowdon Mountain Railway, don't have that sort of story to tell. With Snowden, once the tragic opening special had been in claimed engine number one, the railway has just sat there and run for more than a century. That doesn't sound very exciting, does it? But of course, that completely ignores the fact that, again, that sort of review has been done before. So, I hear you ask, what about a behind-the-scenes tour of each railway? That's another can of worms that I don't really wish to open. Or rather, it's not one that I think every single heritage railway on the scene will take very kindly to. No doubt some of the smaller ones that are either just starting out or have been small for several years would love the free publicity, but the big league ones are becoming more and more prone to concern regarding bad press over how they do things, which may or may not trigger the accountants or the health and safety people breathing down their necks, as if they don't get enough trouble from those people already. The only way I can see being different to any kind of reviews which would make such a series stand out from the crowd and engage sufficient interest is to look at Heritage Railways critically. And trust me, that's the hardest thing that anybody can do unless they're prepared to make like coal and burn. See, long before Steam Locos in Profile came into being, I actually tried this out with a series of blog reviews. I hesitate to bring them up, seeing as only a small number of people paid attention to them and commented on them, despite me writing and publishing new content every week at one point, and no, I'm not going to revitalise that blog because it's not something I fancy starting up again, but I will give you a quick rundown on what they were like. They looked at everything from the perspective of not the die-hard enthusiast who already knows these railways back to front, but the casual tourist who may have never been before, taking in all aspects from directions to appearances to catering, retail, and the journey along the line. It was pretty thorough and pretty hard work, which quickly didn't become fun to do, not least because it attracted petty nitpicking from forum warriors who just didn't get the point of them to begin with. Although looking back at them, yeah, I can see why some people didn't like them. And I know what one or two people who actually enjoyed reading that rubbish are going to say, Oh, come on, Chris, those were really good. You need to do more. No, no, they weren't, and no, I don't. They were overcomplicated, sometimes misinformed, repeated what others had already said, the prices of everything went out of date within a year of publication, and occasionally my words were unfair on the efforts of the volunteers. And that last point is the main reason why I'm hesitant in producing a show similar to Slips about heritage lines. 
Constructive criticism is easily taken the wrong way, and the moment you apply it, someone, somewhere, either immediately goes into attack mode or defends said criticism with the reason why such a criticism has been earned in the first place. The latter is completely understandable if it's applied to the appropriate context. For example, the Avon Valley Railway has a privately owned LMS4F on site, which has yet to be restored from scrapyard condition. Now, it's easy for the casual first-time visitor or the armchair enthusiast to look at it and assume the railway can't be bothered to work on it, but in reality, the politics between locomotive owners and site occupiers are a lot more complicated than that. I can't speak on behalf of decisions that the Avon Valley or the London Midland Society make, nor do I intend to, but whatever the circumstances, it's not something which can be blamed on the frontline volunteers who are willfully giving up their free time for the sake of running the railway. If you're pissed off with the lack of progress on a locomotive restoration, there's no point having a go at the TTI or the cleaner or even the AVR trustees. If they're hardy enough, they're likely to say to you, if you think you know best, why don't you get involved somewhere, you useless piece of armchair veg? But if they're not hardy enough, they may just bottle it and think to themselves, sod this, people don't appreciate my efforts, I'm off to play football. And that becomes a volunteer who's put off the hobby, potentially for good. And before anyone thinks that I'm just being sceptical here, it's not just me who's tried and failed to make a series of critical reviews work in this fashion. In 1999 and the year 2000, Steam Railway magazine published a series of monthly reviews from a man called George Pembroke, who looked at railways in a critical fashion and rated them out of five stars. Big league lines at the time, such as the Bluebell, Seven Valley and West Somerset, did unsurprisingly well, but lesser knowns that don't get quite as much income and publicity like the Strathspey Railway in the Scottish Highlands didn't do quite so well. Now, sure enough, if a job hasn't been done very well, it's worth pointing out so that improvements can be prioritised to enhance the visitor's experience. But on the other hand, it's easy for the casual onlooker to skip over the pluses and minuses of a full review, judge a whole day out on a single aggregate rating, think to themselves, well, I'm not wasting my money on that clearly carefully marked pile of crap, and prevent said railway from getting the income it needs in order to develop and prosper. Looking at this from a volunteer's perspective, nothing is more demoralising than doing the best job you can under difficult circumstances that are impossible to explain clearly, and then people either don't show up or think that your efforts are just worthless because one person who caught you out on a bad day says they're worthless. Now by this point you may be saying, you're overthinking it Chris, you don't have to be critical, just shoot some footage of the railway and edit it together, that'll do. Yeah, that'll do, but thanks to the internet, it's now being done by tons of other people, which has made it boring. The terrific advance in user-friendly consumer video technology and self-publication through the internet means that it's easy for anybody with a video camera and a YouTube to think they're the next David f***ing Lean, when in reality, some of them are more like a specialist contemporary version of the average You've Been Framed contributor. If you strive to be exactly like other people in your field with similar content to theirs, then you don't really stand out as a unique contributor in your field. In short, yes, reviewing heritage railways in a similar fashion to slips sounds like an easy and interesting idea. But until there's a way of doing it which hasn't been done before, isn't going to date itself overnight, isn't going to break the bank in producing it, isn't going to piss anybody off through criticism or send them to sleep through boredom, I would rather just stick to steam locomotives. Because despite most of them taking years to review properly, they're actually much easier to talk about. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.